So someday we're going to be singing these songs to him in person. And I'm looking forward to that. It'll be absolutely in beyond our imagination what we can think about now. Uh, we haven't seen him, and yet we still believe him. We know his word is true. When we read it, the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that it's the truth and reality. All these things are going to happen that it talks about someday. So this morning we're going to be talking about the wrath of God. That's where we are in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 speaks of the wrath of God is coming upon the people of this world and it won't be too long before his wrath turns upon the people of this world. God does get angry and when he does it's a terrifying thing. So as we turn to the scriptures, uh, turn to the truth of what he says, we want to turn to him in prayer and ask his Holy Spirit to uh, empower us to understand and to uh, make this word go out in power and in boldness. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you will uh, enable this speaker to speak with your power and your boldness and your truth and the wisdom that is in your word. Help us by your spirit to understand these truths before us and pray that the life-changing power in them would have its place today in our hearts to change our lives uh, more to be like you want us to be. So Father, bless our time. We pray that you will receive all the glory and praise for everything that is said and done. And we do thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our savior and thank you for uh, the cross that he bore all of our sin on and the blood that was shed and the uh, significance of all of that. Lord, help us to understand these things today. And we give you all the praise for hearing our prayer and for being an almighty God who answers our prayer. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. So we are looking at Romans chapter 118, looking at God's wrath. Um, when you have kids, you understand that sometimes you get kind of angry with them. And I remember a time when I was a little kid, little guy, and uh, my dad was doing work in the backyard with a weeping willow tree roots that growing through the sewer line, plug the sewer up. So uh, he was a do-it-yourselfer. So he dug a hole there and cut out the old bad part of the line and cut away the roots and uh, put the new piece of pipe in and sealed it all up and everything. And he gave me strict instructions that if I had to use the restroom within the few hours that he was doing this, do not flush the toilet. So after a while, going about my business and playing and having fun and whatever, I had to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom and without thinking a thing about it, flushed the toilet. And then I heard my dad and my dad was angry, and he called me out to the hole to watch the water filling the hole because the pipe, of course, hadn't sealed up, and all of his work had just gone, huh, gone away because my water flushing toilet was now coming up through all the work he had did. So he wanted me to have a close-up view, so he took my head and pushed me down into the hole, not under the water, but... He wanted me to have a close-up view, and uh, he was letting me know in his anger uh, what great grief I had cost him, because now he had to wait for the water to get out of the hole and go through this whole thing all over again. And, of course, we couldn't use any water until all this was fixed up. So having kids of my own, I found out that they can do things that make you mad. And now having a whole new batch of kids, I can see how they make me mad sometimes and mom mad they even make people around them mad sometimes and um, other times they're the most precious little angels and you just uh, want to hug them and love them and, and get them stuff and other times you, you think is there a place where I can turn them back in and of course you can't do that uh, we got to have the responsibility got to take that responsibility of raising them well God with his people 
and all the people on the wor world that he has made, he gets angry at us. And w when he gets angry, um, it's a terrifying thing. Uh, God is big and he's powerful. He's all powerful. I don't know if you uh, saw, it was one of the, the, the uh, Men in Black movies where at the end of the movie, it shows the planet Earth and then a big hand comes down and shoots it away like a marble just with his thumb, and God, when he gets angry, he could do something like that. But he has a whole outline of prophecy where this world's going, so we don't have to worry about that. But he's the one that made it, and uh, he's the one that could, um, well, I think at the end of the tribulation, God, in his wrath, in his anger, has an earthquake come on the world that is so severe that every island in the world disappears. Every mountain in the entire world is laid flat. Every city in the world is rubble. And it's almost like God takes the planet and just shakes it. He's so angry at people. And he's not done. Then he brings 100-pound hailstones upon the earth in his anger and his wrath against people that utterly defy him and hate him and shake their fist at him and won't do anything that they're told. So everybody really needs to be aware that God does get angry, and even that there is a God. And in this world, we don't see much sign of the true and living God. If you sit down and read your Bible, you see him. If you go to church, hopefully the church is preaching the Bible, and you hear his word being taught. But how awesome and powerful is God? We're pretty impressed by people. You ever see in movies where the hero says, you know, you don't know who you're messing with. You don't know who I am, you know. And uh, one time when I was working at a security in a casino, I had a call, and there was a lady with all about four kids with her or so, and she was claiming that she was a gypsy, and the gypsy mafia was there in town to kill her daughter who was in jail. And so she painted this picture of uh, the mafia was there, the, the gypsies, and they were going to assassinate this woman. And so uh, she demanded that we call the sheriff because one of them was there in the casino and she recognized him and said that he was going to kill her kids and kill her and her daughter in jail. Because her daughter in jail, uh, they thought, was going to expose a lot of the gypsies' wrongdoings. Wow, this is a fun call. <laughs> Never heard anything like this before, so we call the sheriff, and the sheriff phone shows up, and he's somebody from down in the valley in Douglas County. He's not up at the lake, so he wasn't aware of any of this, so he calls down, uh, he calls the lake jail, and he's talking to them, and he's going, uh-huh, oh, okay, and he hangs up the phone, and he said, it's all true. It's all true, and he says, yeah, they've been having laser sights looking through some of the windows in their jail. And he says, the exact words they said, there's some pretty heavy hitters in town. The Gypsum Mafia was there. And a few months later, she was talking about, I think it was Dateline, if I'm not mistaken. And a few months later, I see a video of Dateline, an episode with her. <laughs> and it was all true. And, and she was a bad lady. <laughs> and doing very bad things. Pretty heavy hitters that, that they were very concerned that these professional hitmen were going to come and kill this woman in jail. Uh, you hear people in movies saying, you're way over your head in this, or you're, this is way above your pay grade. You know, we're so, um, we have superheroes today we look at and we're so impressed with them. Uh, when I was a little kid, I used to hear every now and then go to the principal's office, and it was like, oh, you know, not her. I got to face her. Uh, in our times that we lived, we've heard the expression shock and awe. They want to do such devastating and powerful and awesome things with explosions and missiles and planes that the enemy is just terrified. And, and then we've seen the, the scenes where the, the boxing match and the, or the UFC match and where the guy's coming down the aisle and all the smoke is rising and the music's playing and the announcer with his big deep radio voice is announcing the big 
the big man that's going to come down and defeat the opponent, and we're so impressed with people. But who are people compared to God? We don't think about God very much. This world doesn't seem to think about him at all. It seems like they're really trying to erase him. But the Bible puts perspective on all this because it's written by God, and he wants us to understand just who he is and how powerful he is. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. <laughs> He's the one we need to be afraid of. He's the awesome one. So as we look at the wrath of God this morning, we just want to look at it through three short points. Uh, first of all, why God's wrath is so serious. It matters when he gets mad. He did some awesome things to people when he gets mad. And then secondly, why the lost need to be terrified of God's wrath, so terrified that they say, I need a savior to save me from my sin. And, and the tendency is today to say, no, you don't want to scare people into salvation. The Bible does. It makes people terrified of who God is and what he can do to us. Fear him who can destroy not only your body, but your soul forever. And then the third point is why believers are saved from God's wrath. Why we don't have to experience hell. So first of all, why is God's wrath so serious? Well, the answer is because God is truly awesome. I, I guess that word, uh, you know, how much does that mean? But God is awesome in power. And there's, uh, in Psalm chapter 2, there's a, a feeling amongst the nations in a certain time in history when the nations say to God, we're done with you. You don't own us anymore. You can't tell us what to do. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does God look at all this? So Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? Oh, the nations are angry with God? <laughs> why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Well, they're making plots, but their plots will be in vain. The kings of the earth, they set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. They're just saying God isn't going to restrain us, and we don't have to follow his laws. So God looks at all this in verse 4, and he says, He who sits in the heavens holds them in derision. He laughs at them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. He's one that you want on your side. You want to be on his side. But all the nations of the world, to him, he just laughs at them and all of their plans. You've got to think about how big the universe is and that God fills all of it. And then the, the little speck of earth and then the little speck of people upon that earth. In Isaiah, it shows how big God is. Isaiah chapter 40. He's... Enormous, as big as the universe. We have no idea how big he is. Isaiah 40, verse 12. 
who has measured the waters, and we're talking about all the waters on the planet. He measures the wa waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span. He marks off the heavens. He sees how big they are. He enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure. He weighs the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? I once knew a man who told me when he gets to heaven, he's going to tell God a few things, how he did a few things wrong and he could have done them better. Huh. What man shows his counsel to God? Whom did he consult? Who did God consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? He's the one that just speaks and atoms and molecules and all of the elements of this earth all come into being. He just tells them to and they do. He's the one that designed them all, that they would be perfect. He was one that designed everything about a bird with all the hollow wings and all these things where the lungs just never get out of air and he never gets tired and he can just fly for miles. Nobody told him how to do this. We have planes that look like his birds. <laughs> He's the smart one. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are accounted as just dust on the scales. There's nothing on the scales, just the dust. He takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and he casts it for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering, well, he chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and he spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing, and he makes the rulers of the earth an emptiness? This is the God, the Holy One of Israel, the one that created everything, the one that in one day, made all the stars in the universe, trillions of them. And he said, not one of them is missing. If there's some wise guy that looks up with his telescope and says, I think there should have been one there. God said, no, none of them are missing. Everyone that's supposed to be there is there. Not only that, I am so smart. My vocabulary is so big. I have a name for every single one. Maybe throughout uh, all eternity, we'll get to know all the names of all the stars. God will tell us what each one is named and why. He, he makes them so that they don't burn out. At night, when you have a wood stove, you throw a log on the fire. In the morning, you get up and it's gone. So you need a pile of wood. And when that goes down, you need another pile. But these stars never burn out. They just keep glowing. Our own sun I just read recently that in the sun, there's like this big dark spot that's like a big hole in it. They said every once in a while, it, this appears. And, and uh, just in the last few weeks, it had a big flare going out on the other side of it. They said if it would have been on the Earth side of it, it would have killed every electronic device on the whole planet. It would have been gone, melted, destroyed. God makes the sun, and he makes the flare shoot out of the right place at the right time. He makes big old holes in it, but somehow you go out in the sun now, and it hits your face, and you say, wow, this feels so nice. It's just perfect. Who, do, who can do that from 93 million miles away? <laughs> God does. How, how come the, the moon gets eclipsed, and the sun gets eclipsed, because the earth and the moon and the sun are all the right distances and diameters. God does this. 
And God says, who told me how to do all this stuff? We're still learning about the stuff. I, I watched a Christian video with all these very intelligent Christian scientists. One of them I had as a professor in college, physical science. And they said, what is gravity? What holds us here on the earth so we don't go flying away like in the moon or somewhere? They don't know. They kind of know what makes gravity. They have some formulas, but they, they still don't know. The best scientists in the world that are truthful ones, they don't know. God makes it because he wants us to be here on earth. He doesn't want us flying off into space where we die. He makes and gives us what we need. He is the God, the almighty creator. And in the book of Acts, when uh, Paul was talking to the Greeks and all the philosophers and the smart guys, talking to them about the creator, because they have a temple there, and the temple is full of all these gods that they put in these different rooms and on shelves or on the floor. It's a big one. And he says, I was looking around your city, and I saw idols everywhere in this big old temple here. He says, I notice you have a temple to the unknown God. He says, well, I want to tell you about this unknown God, that I know who he is. And so Paul does. They, they get a hold of Paul, and they say, we want you to come and tell us all these new things. We've never heard this stuff before. And in Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, uh, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way. You guys are religious. Wow, your religious idols are everywhere in town. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as an unknown, this I proclaim to you. And here is the real God, the only true one, the only living one. The God who made the world and everything in it. That's God. He's the one that is eternal and never had a beginning. And everything that has existed, every molecule, every tree, every fish, every bird, every planet, every star, every moon. All the things that are invisible that we don't even know about. It is God who made them all and everything in it. And he is the Lord of all of the heavens and the earth as well. And he doesn't live in a house made by God, by man. When you build these temples, he's too big to fit in there. <laughs> he's not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Those, they needed to have people come and dust off the idols and maintain the idols. I suppose if they were brass or something, they, they had to have somebody, you know, with all the oxidation on it and whatever. He, God says, I don't need anything from the people that I made because he himself, he is the one that gives. He gives to mankind, he gives us life. He breathed life into Adam, and so we all have life when we're born. And his he gives breath to everything, and he gives everything that we have. And Paul didn't even give a whole list. He just said everything comes from him. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. All of the nations God made. And now we have a one world government that wants to erase them all. They don't like what God has made. He has determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place of all these nations. He declares right here that nations have boundaries. That's borders. That's what makes a nation a nation. God made them. And these uh, evil people in this world are trying to erase the borders in America and all over the world. And God wants people to seek him and find our way towards him and find him. For he actually is not far from each one of us. To him, in him, we live and we move and we have our being. And yet some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Well, we're all made in the image of God, every human being. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art 
and imagination of a man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. See your sin. Not want to do sin. Want to change. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. God has a day when every human being will have to stand before the Creator. And the Creator is going to judge that person with the Creator's standard of righteousness, not ours. We tend to make up our own standards. We're like our own little God. And when you ask someone, do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? And the person will say, oh, I think I've done pretty well. You know, I, I've got, had my moments, but I try to be nice to people. I try to help people. I try to think of others. And so they're setting up their own standards of righteousness. But on this fixed day, we're God. It's not our righteousness. It's God's righteousness that's going to judge this world. And he says, I'm going to do it with a man. I'm going to do it with a man. And as... Uh, by a man who has, he has appointed. And it says in other parts of the Bible that God has given all judgment over to the Son, to Jesus Christ. And of this he has given assurance by raising him from the dead. Who did God raise from the dead? He raised his son Jesus from the dead. And of course when they heard this, resurrection of the dead, well some just mocked Paul, mocked that whole idea. They don't think it's possible. Another said, well, we'll hear you more about this. And some others, and he names a few people and a few ladies, he says they believed it, and they trusted Christ as their Savior. And isn't that the way it is in the world? You tell the gospel story, and you say that someday God will judge everybody, and you better have a Savior, or you're going to need one, and its Savior is only Jesus, and that's it. And Some people do mock, and some people say, well, I'll put it off till later. We had a memorial service here yesterday for Tim, and the room was pretty full. And we talked about that, that Tim wasn't that old. And Tim and I used to talk sometimes, and he said, well, I'm going to live longer than you. You're so much older than I am. And I said, probably. I'm sure you will. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, Tim is in heaven. He's gone. Sometimes we don't know when we're going to die. All the time we don't know when we're going to die. It can come at any time. And God is saying you need to be ready for this judgment that's coming. And the only time you can do that is here on earth. Once you pass from this earth, you can't be ready anymore. Your, your doom is sealed, whether it be heaven or hell. The place where you're going is sealed. Human beings live forever. And you'll either be in hell forever or heaven forever. So it's really important why God's wrath is so serious. He's a God that can shake the earth if he wants. And he's a God that everybody is responsible to, to one day stand before him. And now we want to look at uh, why the lost need to be terrified of God's wrath. H and they do. And people do need to be facing that and seeing the truth that there is a God uh, many, uh, a few generations ago, there was a man named Jonathan Edwards, and a famous sermon of his was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And when he preached that sermon, he was a very poor preacher and speaker. And at, at nighttime, uh, this was in the days when they just had candles, and he had a candle, and he would shake, and he would read his sermon. He would just read it. And people who were coming to Christ by the, the hundreds and the thousands. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. He said he was afraid to read his own sermon every time he, when he read it. People need to be afraid of God's wrath. Because they are lost from not the point of birth, from the point of conception. It says in Psalm 51, 5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He was born in iniquity and sin, evil. And in sin did my mother conceive me from the very point of conception. 
For it is in Adam all die. Every human being that is born from Adam, and that is every human being, they're all going to die. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, Adam's one sin, all men now are condemned because of that. And in Ephesians 2.3, uh, all people, when they're born, are called by nature children of wrath. We're children of God's wrath. We have God's wrath upon every human being. And all of mankind is like that, like the rest of mankind. And then Romans 9.22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, he has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath. The vessels of wrath are people and they're prepared for destruction. They should be afraid of a God because they're born into this world without hope and without God. They're dead to him. And God does get very angry with sin. He judges sin and he judges sinners. In the book of Judges, it goes through a cycle and it repeats it over and over and over where the people grow so evil, they're worshiping all the idols of the land and they're not worshiping the true and living God anymore that revealed himself to them as a people. And then he allows them to be overrun by an enemy nation and they're oppressed and the enemy nation keeps taking their food away. They take all their weapons away. So they can't fight back and then they finally cry out to God, have mercy, and then God answers them again and raises up a judge like uh, Gideon or Samson or, and, and these people deliver them from their enemy. Then as soon as the judge dies, they go right back to their idol worship, forsaking God again. And he doesn't put up with their sin. He brings somebody else to oppress them and make their life just horrible. The book of Judges, every man does what is right in his own eyes because there was no king in Israel. And then in Psalm 78, uh, it's talking about the history of Israel, how they just kept turning, doing the same thing like they did in Judges. They kept turning away from God, and God kept having to judge them for their sin. And, and another thing, because of all of their sin, the, the sinner has to be afraid of their final destination for sinners, which is hell. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. When, when we sin, it doesn't go unnoticed. God notices, and he actually keeps a record of it all. And there's wages for doing that, and the wages is you have to pay for your sin. Only for a human being, he pays for his sin in a place that God made, is called hell, and he pays for that forever, because he can never stop paying for it. He can't pay for it all. It's insufficient. And so that's why hell goes on forever and ever and ever. There is a, a lake of fire that God made. And there is a time in history when people will be thrown into it. And if you can imagine, um, I used to burn sulfur in a teaspoon with my chemistry set and just to get the rotten egg smell and all of that and the little beautiful blue flame that would glow. But I can't imagine a swimming pool full of that, of, of the stuff on fire and the burning and, and um, the, the, the noxious smells and you can't breathe it, it gags you, but you can't die because you're already dead. It's called the second death. And in Revelation chapter 20, it, it talks about this and this great white throne. And that's the scene that we read about in Acts that Paul was talking about. In Acts, uh, uh, Revelation 20, verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And that appears to be Jesus Christ. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away. There's going to be nobody back talking Jesus when he's on this throne. They're terrified of him. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small. All the great, the ones that always bribe people to get off or erase hard drives or, or uh, pay money for false witnesses. 
all of those people, they're going to be standing there, and the small people, every human being that has ever been born since the time of Adam and Eve, that is unsaved before this throne, and there's books that are opened, and all of their sins are written in this book so that they will have no excuse of saying, well, they didn't know that was wrong, or they didn't know what the penalty would be. All these people nowadays that deny Jesus Christ, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who's one of the world's most read authors, Obama's favorite author, this man that says all this talk about Jesus being the Savior and rising from the dead, he said it's all fake news. Well, if he doesn't trust Christ as his Savior, he will be there before the one that he said is fake news. And he will be judged by his words that are written in that book according to everything that they had done. <coughs> and the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. There are people that say, well, the wages of sin is death. That means the person just dies and there's no judgment. There's no eternity in hell because he's dead. He's just gone. He's out of his existence. No more consciousness. Well, the dead are coming, resurrecting back, and they're being judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. So there is eternal suffering for everyone. The temporary hell that's in now is going to end up in the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The unsaved should be very terrified about this. And, and us as believers that share the gospel with people, it, it is important that we see the outcome of people, what can happen to them in the lake of fire forever. And uh, God said, I'm not willing that any perish. God says, I don't rejoice over the death of a, even a wicked person. I provided my Savior for everybody, and I wish that everybody would take the Savior and be saved. And, and that includes uh, uh, Hitler and Stalin and, and Mao and, and all of them. And it also includes our political opponents in the time we live. We should pray that they'll be guilty for their sin and turn to a Savior, that they can hear the gospel and be saved. Hell uh, because you can never get out of it. You can never leave it. There is never a chance forever. That is your lot forever and ever, and it will never change. Just that in itself is so terrifying and having no hope. We shouldn't wish that on anybody. And God hates sin. He hates it when people sin. We say that God loves the person and not the sin. He does love everybody in the world, but he hates the people that do it. If we look at the book of Mark, the Pharisees were so concerned about washing hands and um, getting germs inside of your body or your wickedness and defilement from the, the dirty cup or the dirty plate and Jesus is trying to tell them, no, your defilement, all of your sin isn't coming from the outside. It's coming from inside, from your heart. That's where it's all coming from. And all these things that God hates that he said, this is what sin is. You look at Mark 7, 21. And he says, from within, out of the heart of man, come. And here's the things that he hates. He hates evil thoughts. He hates sexual immorality. He hates theft and murder and adultery and coveting and wickedness and deceit, sensuality. All these evil things come from within and they defile the person. That's we're all born sinners and that's the kind of stuff that sinners do. And then uh, talking to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says to them, don't you people know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? God's wrath is coming upon the unrighteousness 
of this world, the people that behave unrighteous. They, they don't want to do what God says is right. And they will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, don't be deceived because this world deceives us and doesn't want us to even think about this stuff. A lot of these sins the world says is okay now. And they tell us that if we don't agree with them that they're okay, that we're wrong and we need to be punished. But in the end, this is the truth. This is what God says. God says, don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. If you read that in Canada, you're in trouble. You're going to get fined and maybe do jail time. Nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. They won't be there because God will tolerate that sin. He sets the standard. And he says, some of you were like these people, but you're saved, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We do these sins, and the world will hold, us, hold them against us and remind us of them, but not God. God says, I throw them in the deepest sea and forget them. All of your past sins, all of your future sins, in the Lord Jesus Christ, they've all been forgiven, all of them. We've been washed and we're made clean by his blood that he shed for us on the cross. In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the deeds of the flesh. There they all are. And, and in Romans chapter 1, it, it makes a list of sins there. Golly, who would want to live in a part of town with your neighbors like this? It says in Romans 1.28, uh, these people, and, and it's the people that are here today now, they do not see fit to acknowledge God. Yeah, he's fake news. So God gives them up. What does he give them up to? A debased mind. And these are some of the greatest intellectuals of the world. Well, they happen to have a debased mind. And they're doing what ought not to be done. Because God says there are things that not, no one should be doing. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Remember God drowned the whole world because of this kind of behavior? All manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They are gossips slanderers look at the company that gossipers and slanders is put in they're haters of god and they hate us too because we're from god insolent they're haughty they're boastful they invent evil huh they're disobedient to parents they're foolish they're faithless they're heartless they're ruthless Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And we're seeing this in the world right now. These evil things, they are approving them. People go to get arrested for doing some heinous murder even. And the judge lets them out on a very low bail. And a lot of them are going out and doing it all over again while they're, on, they're ba out on bail. They're letting the criminals go free and putting the innocent in prison. And they're saying to all of the people that are innocent and want to do righteous and right, the believers and other just people trying to be good, they're saying, you have to agree with us that these things are okay. And if you don't, we're going to turn the law and the FBI on you. And that's what's happening in our country today. But this is the truth. What these people doing are despicable. All, all the words that are deplorable, wrong, bad, evil. And I've mentioned the, one of the current laws in our legislature in Nevada right now is they want to put 
uh, centers and schools in Nevada, and it's going to be Planned Parenthood, without the parent's knowledge or permission. They can take your teenage daughter or son, give them hormone blockers. They can mutilate parts of their body and cut them off, and you don't get to know about it as a parent. They're trying to make this a law in Nevada. And they're trying to do evil, inventing evil. And God will not put up with it. They don't believe in the God who has standards and laws. And how dare they take our kids away from us and demand that they can do this to them. These people have no idea what's coming on this world, but they're going to find out. The tribulation period's coming. And, and some of them will turn to Christ, but most of them won't. Most of them will just shake their fist at God. And in this uh, passage in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11, all, all these sins are listed. And another time it says, men who practice homosexuality. And people say, the Bible doesn't say that. There it is. It says it. And people's minds are just being flooded with it, especially watching TV and movies and advertising and magazines and the radio. We're just being flooded with it, trying to conform our minds to the satanic filth of the world and the lawlessness. They don't follow God's laws. They're in trouble. They should be very knowledgeable of a God that gets angry at sinners. And then... Finally, why believers are saved from God's wrath? Because Christ died for our sins. It says in Corinthians 15.3, Christ died for our sins. Hebrews 1.3, after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His payment for, payment for sin was completed, and he said, it is finished. And he went up to heaven and ascended to heaven and then sat down. There's no more work that needs to be accomplished. There never was for people. We can't do anything to save ourselves. No works allowed. But what Christ did was everything. That one sacrifice, never to be repeated, never need to be repeated. It satisfied God the Father. It propitiated him. And then in 1 Peter 2, 4, he himself... He bore our sins in his body on the tree. And how do we make this our own? We believe the truth of it. We believe that Jesus Christ paid it all and satisfied God. So no more sacrifice needs to be made. Never any works needed to be done. And in John, who wrote his gospel with all of the miracles in it and all the things Jesus did, he said, Jesus did a whole lot more than I wrote down, but every one that I wrote down, all these are written so that, here's the reason they were written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. This man, Jesus, that was born from Mary, and God was his father. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that by believing you might have life in his name, eternal life, living forever. He said, I'm the bread of life. Anybody that eats from me will live forever. Trust in me as your Savior. Believe that my body was broken, not for my sin, but for yours. Believe that my, shed was, my blood was shed, not for my sin, but for yours. You put your trust in that, and then you will be saved. In Acts, uh, they were in prison, and God released them from prison with a big earthquake, and all the chains fell off, and the doors flew open, and the poor prison guard was ready to kill himself, and Paul said, no, we're still here, and the prison guard wanted to know one thing, and one thing only. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He had seen the power of God. He knew that there is a real God, and his own sinfulness he needs to be saved. What do I have to do? And the answer was just very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe, trust in, rely upon. Put all your eggs in his basket. No works allowed, no other God. 
just Jesus. He paid the price for our sin. That's how believers don't have to experience the wrath of God. And then there is a wrath to come, the tribulation period. In Thessalonians, they, they heard this from Paul, Thessalonians 1.10. Paul said, I've heard about your salvation and that you're waiting for his son from heaven. Waiting for his son. And that's what we should all be doing. Waiting for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. The book of Thessalonians is talking about the removal of the church up into the air. And he says, you people are waiting for him to come and delivering us from this wrath that is coming upon this world. And then in chapter 5, verse 9, he tells the Thessalonians and us and all the church people, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God is coming on this world, and when it first shows up, the people of the world are going to be utterly terrified. Uh, later on, under the direction of the Antichrist, they're going to be shaking their fist at God and hating him. But when, when, when it starts, and all the way through it, nothing like this has ever happened in the world. But these words are literal, and we're going to look in Revelation chapter 6. The words are literal. And they're going to happen, and they're true. And it involves the sixth seal that Jesus himself opens up. In Revelation 6, 12, the sixth seal was opened up, and I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The world has never felt an earthquake like it's going to feel now, this one. Worse, the worst earthquakes are still to come after this one, but this one's going to get everybody's attention. And then the sun became black like sackcloth. Maybe, maybe it's the volcanic action or something. The sun is just blocked out and it's black. We saw that just with the smoke in the sky last summer. The sun is blocked out like sackcloth. And, and the full moon became like blood, red. And the stars of the sky fell to earth some kind of huge meteor showers. And as the fig tree sheds its fruit in the winter when it's shaken by a gale storm wind, and the sky, the sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up. The sky's being rolled up. And they're seeing into the sky. And every mountain and island was removed from this place. Seven years from this point, at the end, every island is going to be gone. There will be no more islands. People that say Revelation already happened, well, then how come you can go on vacation to Hawaii? Because this says it'll be gone. Every mountain will be flat, removed, gone. And, and how do people respond to this? The kings of the earth and the great ones starts at the top and it's going down the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone and slave and free. They always talk about slavery. They're going to have slaves. They're hypocrites. What did they do? They hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us. Because now the heavens have been opened and they can see God's face looking down on them. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. And from who else? From the wrath of the Lamb. Yeah, Noval Harari, the one that's fake news is going to be looking down on you. The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Nobody's going to be standing. Everybody's going to be absolutely terrified. They would rather die and have rocks fall on them and hide them from the face of God that looks down upon them. They're realizing this is the beginning. Men's hearts fail them for fear. God's wrath is real. He does get angry. 
His wrath doesn't last forever. Christians, anybody can be saved and become a believer in the times we live. And, and that's the message that needs to go out to this world. There is a tribulation period coming, and you don't want to be here. Trust in Christ. There's nothing like it, and there'll never be anything like it again. At this point, one quarter of the world's population will be dead with famines, with the sword, with pestilence, and with wild animals. Wild animals killing people. They're already trying to ban coyote hunting in Nevada. That's another law they have going where they have these times where they go out and they shoot coyotes while they're trying to ban that. They're getting a lot of opposition. The coyotes are shot by the ranchers because they're eating their cattle, killing their livestock. And when you get to be too many coyotes, guess what they start going to for food? People. I saw it myself in Lake Tahoe. And law enforcement had to go out and they killed about 20 of them. But the, they couldn't tell the people. They told us in security what they did. Because they were going after people. I watched it. I was in, in the security car watching coyotes go after an old couple and other people until they went and killed them all. Wild animals are going to be killing people. And diseases like this world has never seen, and it won't be any COVID. <sighs> It'll be a, a disease that kills everybody that has it. The word for disease in this chapter is the word for death. The horse that he rides upon is called thanatos in Greek, death. And this Disease is called thanatos, death. It's just the Greek word for death. The diseases are coming. The famines are coming. The people are going to die. And at the current population, that will be over 2 billion people. They're going to need more caskets. And how does CNN cover this? It's the great tribulation. God's wrath coming upon the sinners of the world. They're trying to divide Jerusalem and give half of it to the Palestinians and declare it's their capital too. And God says, when you do that, my wrath is coming. I'm coming down to stop it. And he will. And all of these evil world leaders that think they have the whole world sewn up by having a digital currency, a digital ID, so you can't buy or sell. They don't know that someday Jesus Christ is going to come back and one in one day, in one moment, he will put an end to it all. And be, there'll never be a leadership of world government again without Jesus Christ ruling over it for all eternity. And, and Daniel says that his kingdom is eternal. It will never end. And we never have to put up with man's nonsense again. We just have to do what Jesus says and we'll love it. <laughs> It'll be better than Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> It'll be the best place in the world to live. No more tears, no more sorrow, sadness, no more memorial services, no more death, no more aches and pains. And uh, Looking forward to that. Paul said, my body is like a tent and I'm ready to turn it in because I want a new heavenly body that God is going to give me. He couldn't wait to turn his tent in. And that should be with us. Can't wait to turn this old tent in. It's getting worn out. And maybe the zipper doesn't work so well. And the floor is leaky. And the roof is leaky. And uh, man hasn't figured out how to, how to, all the spare parts that we need. So God's wrath is coming. But God provides a way out through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise that you give us in your word of delivering us from this wrath. And Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to die for us and pay for our sin so that we don't have to experience your wrath. We give you all the praise and glory. And Father, put in our hearts a burning desire to share this good news of the death of your son as payment for sin with everybody that we know and everybody that we meet. And we thank you, Lord, for showing us these things and thank you that they are true and trustworthy. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.